Bonjour et bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, Professor Mita Ghosh, Director of Alice Forces de Lucknow, welcome you all to this evening's third session of the monthly webinar series organized by Alice Forces de Lucknow that is based on the Indo-French shared cultures. Today, we are honored to welcome a very special and a renowned speaker, Dr. Rosie Lewin Jones, who is a well known British scholar and an expert on Claude Martin. We are really fortunate that we witnessed her delivering a talk on the topic Claude Martin and the French in our. I am sure, madam, that your presentation will be truly enriching, especially for those viewers who have only heard about Claude Martin but are not at all aware about his connection with the Awards rulers during your reign in thank India you. and also his very thank contribution to the to Lucknow, Lucknowite and Lucknow culture. But before we go a step ahead, I wish to show you a short video that will inform you about the aims and different death courses offered at Alice Hostel the Lucknow and the importance of for students aged 6 to 70 years in order to succeed both personally and professionally. Speaker. Now going a step ahead, I wish to extend a very warm welcome to Madam Alice Goni, who has worked in several alliances all over the world and in India. Presently, Alice is working in Antitude Frosty, Embassy of France, as the coordinator of the Alliance Frosty Network in India. In fact, 
she is the best person to inform us all about the aims and objectives of the alliances the del courses alliances offer to interested students all over the world and the importance of offering the internationally recognized diploma certificate with a lifelong validity over to you alice alice would that love Alice. I don't think you are in. Alice. Is it with Atla? Uh I Alice. She's not there. So okay. If she joins so, the meeting. Yeah? I so think she was your sometime back. I would now mm -hmm. go to the next step. She's not. I would request Mrs. Zora Chatterjee, President of Alliance for Sister Lucknow and the architect of the monthly webinar series organized by Alliance for Sister Lucknow to spread awareness about Indian French shared cultures. Zora ma'am, please, it's now all over to you. You're not audible, Zora ma'am. Speaker on the screen. I muted myself. I do not know. Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, Alex, we were calling you. Left. Okay, okay, okay. You come back if you when you can. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, talking to Alice actually. Okay. She had a telephone phone in the drawer. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. I, uh, yes, you are audible, ma'am. It's okay. Go on. Thank 
And this is one instance that he went north. But um, in more detail a little later. Next. One of Jean Tiel's companions, and in fact somebody who knew Paul Martin, and in fact actually come to tell you Paul Martin, Paul France was René Adam, an interesting man, and this is what he said. Uh, he said the cruelty and the envy with which the English prisoners in Madras can't be described. Of course, the English ship man, the French. And man, very inconsistent with the customs and limitations, they say. So you can see all the sweetness of the night. So, my dad and many others were actually forced by the English to serve in the East India Cup army. And you might think this was a difficult thing, but if you imagine there are so many ex soldiers without food, without payment, and the only way they're going to survive physically is by joining and that is fighting for the company or the enemy, if you like. And this a lot of it started. And English company army started to move. They were going to take on Shujabla, the mother of Bengal, and the Mughal Shah Alam. So what they've got to their retinue is that's different. Some people say about a hundred, some people say about hundred. They've got three hundred very reluctant French soldiers who left Pontichery and they're now half supporting the English. Before we actually discuss this slide, you've got to imagine that the French, being very unhappy about them, decided to desert. And the Kamanasa River, the English court at Kamanasa, in what is now UP, about a hundred of them took off, and they took off with me, my dad. Now, we can't always believe everything my says, but he actually tells that he was appointed as their commander. So he's leading between 100 and 200 leaders away from the English number, leading them towards Shujuradola, the number. And this is really the start of French movement in other. Now, this picture, although very large, is important because it's in the top left hand corner, Jean Thiel. Madak, I think, is they are starting to negotiate with Shujar Dola, who is down at the front of the picture, embracing Jean Thiel. And this takes place on what is now a suburb of Carnival at Judge Mode. And Jean Thiel is trying to persuade Shujar Dola with the English East India Company, Dola and his two. And uh, the number of Bengal and the boat he defeated at the Battle of Buxa in 1764. And there's very much Shuja can do about it. The Ish Company army are becoming incredibly powerful. They're pushing up from Bengal. And it's actually a pragmatic move that Jean-Jean um, perspits the number to surrender, if you, to make terms with the English. They are very, very bad for Shuja. He has to pay an enormous sum of money. But in return, he would keep the Frenchman who had actually come up, Jerry, with the debt. And this is when you first a number of French people. And what did they do? Well, obviously, they were in Shuja's army. And they learned. Yeah. Probably just uh, Jean Thiel was one of their leaders, so he wasn't a primary soldier. And I did that too. So they got them into, they trained them with European methods. So we have the situation where Shukru Dolan was still actually in Faisalabad um, and he spent the rest of his life there. So we're looking at the scene in Faisalabad where you've got soldiers training on the but also, importantly, setting up 
Next, please. Uh, this is the result. Here is Antoine, Antoine Louis Pollier, another Frenchman, obviously. And he's sitting in his house. We think it may be in Lucknow, but it's more likely to be in uh, where he know, we know he had a very long office there. And he's lolling back on it, and he's actually watching Indian dancers who we explaining to him the various steps and movements of the musicians, the female musicians, are on the left hand side, as you can see. But what I like about this, to why Voltaire's quotation is so apt, is that Indian climate has done some for us, whether they are English or, or anything else. It's somehow sat, if you like, or perhaps sat there, you're it has changed them, and you can see this, and if you look at this moustache, it's an imitation of the novel's moustache. He's become, if you look at novel himself, he's got his hooker by his side, he's got gorgeous women in Saran, and he's got his own palace in Faisal, and he has become thoroughly Indianized. Next, please. And this is a staggering of what actually happened to Faisabad. <clears throat> Shuja Adola, son, Asaf Adola, decided to move the capital to Lanka because he didn't get on with his mother. What it meant was that Faisabad, which had been a quartering city, became all deserted. And you can see here <clears throat> the palace ramparts are starting to fall. To the river, it's a picture of desolation. Plants are growing out of the little kiosk to the side. So we're moving now from Vaisalad to Lucknow. Next, please. And here we have Walt Martin, who's the subject of the talk, but he wasn't the only Frenchman, but by any means, and he's certainly the first. This is a very fine portrait of him and discovered a couple of years ago, and it's in chalk by Zoffany. <clears throat> now, most of you are familiar with Martin's career. He was born in France in 1735, and as a young man, he was apprenticed to a silk weaver because Lyon was a famous place for the manufacture of silk. And in fact, to some two years, I bought a very, very nice silk shawl when I was years ago. But what's going wrong? There's a full harvest in 49. And what might have seemed like a good prospect to a young, ambitious man suddenly didn't good. So Martin in Rose, when he takes up an Oriental, this is equivalent. English East India Company. They're recruiting in Lyon. He goes along and joins up and tries for his younger brother to join too. When his stepmother heard about it, she was horrified, ran along behind her, managed to pull back her younger son, but absolutely determined. He said, You can't stop me. So his stepmother says, Right. She gives him some money and she said, Don't come back unless you're riding in a carriage. So he goes off, he trains at Norient, and then there's something like a six month journey by sea to Pondicherry. And when he gets there, he gets a pretty rough reception. The um, commander there looks at them and describes Martin and his fellow as a vile rebel. But nevertheless, does very well, and I think the reason is, he's literate, he was handsome, no criminal past, and really ambitious. There's no doubt at all about that. But later on, we find him actually at the guard of General Lully. And what that Martin did learn very, very shortly after arriving in India was to become a cavalry officer. He was a dragoon. He learned to ride and kept yeah. him in very good stead for the rest of his life, up until almost 
the month before his death, he was still horse riding in Lucknow. From a number of chronic illness, he overcame them, and we have to give him all credit. He was 64, which would be considered an old man by your standards in India. So I'm actually quite fond of Paul Martin. Would I have liked met him? I'm not sure. Next. You're familiar with this painting, but I want to put in for a number of reasons. First of all, it shows Johann Zolfany, who I mentioned, probably one of the best known European artists to visit India. And to his left, Zolfany is actually looking at the audience. He's look, looking at him. He's in the middle in front of one of his paintings. Left is Antoine Collier, and again, he's wearing that touristic Navami moustache. He's not a photon, so this was obviously painted during the time. And we believe this was painted and Polly had actually moved. Uh, we don't know where his house was. It was a picked on Polly Gunge. And we think it might have been, for those of you who know Lucknow, across the river in what subsequently became New Hyderabad. And we're pretty sure that Claude Martin, who you see to the right, had that too. We have yet to identify where it was, but we know that this was actually painted in Polio's house. Now, there are a few other people. Martin is standing up. He has a moustache. He's not going to be another. They're both dressed in the jackets of the East India Company. Margaret pointing to a painting with his servants, one of the Kadir brothers, as on the road, we think it was probably on a Vatican canvas. So this is important because this is the chapel. It's the first house we know that Mark had in Lucknow. We don't know much about his previous president, but this house was finished in 1782. And it's a mark it says that he was able to build something like this, a sort of palace, and he called the chateau to up his hometown of Lyon. Now, he seems slightly awkward, <coughs> being a round figure in a black jacket, and this is John Goodman. He is the accountant general for the East India Company, and he's been sent to Harvard to arrange payments for the company's troops, and he's an important and influential man. He came from Yorkshire, but I will say a little bit more about him. So here you have a scene of harmony. Three very successful you both the French. Sophony, French and Google, English with the intimate servants. And one thing that amuses me about this picture, and I know this picture very well indeed. Just to Rosophanes' right, you can see a black shape, it's a black monkey. The monkey is holding up his hat. And the servant has put a banana in his paw. Now, oh, this amuses me because was it Rosophanes' comments on how the, the Europeans uh, reaching for bananas, reaching for what they could get, but it also, in a way, pointing to it now. She's being held up in a platter of fruit, one of his servants, so there's a lot going on in the It's currently in the uh, memorial hall, but it's at such an end that you can stand in front of it, so this is why it would be better to look at a good reproduction. Next, please. And again, this is a very well-known it will be familiar to you. But I put it in oh, the kind of mingling of during Osmodona's reign between Europe and Indians. It was a period of relative tranquility, if you like. Osmodona is in He's wearing this gauzy yellow type shirt and he's gesturing to a friend of his. Colonel Warden, who was apparently very good at arranging events for the number to entertain him. And it's a quite as you can see. And there's a very plump dishman 
side. You don't believe the artist, and again, he is being perhaps. And if you follow right into the centre, there is a tall man, Richmond, in a red coat, looking down at what's going on. It was the resonance of the time, Gabriel Cooper. And Gabriel had an illegitimate little girl, violent woman, who Martin subsequently adopted. She was called Sally. But this picture, there's so much in it. But next, please. I should just finish by you know, what happened to um, Jean and Richmond. When should Rodona die in 1775? The English company approached Oscar his professor, and said, you must get rid of these French, all of them. We don't want French soldiers in Harvard. And it's not why the English company allowed the troops to stay until children It may be that they hoped for more, if they played along with him, was a much weaker character, and he actually completely threatened by the company that he would oppose if he didn't get rid of these French soldiers. So, a hundred to Frenchmen let loose. We do not know what happened to them. We don't know what their names were. But nevertheless, there are a few Frenchmen still left in Abad, in Lucknow, in the capital. And again, they're working on this. And this is the cannon that Gordon lost in the armory. There are two armories. There was one at uh, Golan, just as you can know, Lucknow. This is towards Mm -hmm. That was another arsenal, and this cannon was cast there. The cannon was dedicated to Lord Cornwallis, who was Governor General of India, and obviously Claude Martin wants to keep in. I should say something about Freemasonry because Martin was a Freemason. John Wilmer, who we're seeing, was a Mason. Polly it was a Mason, and certainly so were many of the of the East India Company. It gave them, if you like, and it gave people like Martin who come from the right, a kind of entree society, which I don't think he would have had not been a Mason. So there's quite a lot of symbolism in dedicating this huge cannon to Cornwallis. It was something you did between and it had a public show and appear. It's also a mark of how skilled Martin was in casting something this large. It's on the terrace of La Martinia, Lucknow. Please. And here are some very fine pistols, a pair of pistols that actually have Claude Martin's name on. You may be able to see that on the I'm not going to talk in detail. I know very little about armaments of this period. But they're very, very fine, and you can see the silver furniture, as you actually describe the silver on them, is beautifully engraved. These may have been made for the novel. I think almost certainly they will display and show rather than actually firing them. A very fine pair of pistols. Next, please. And this is something quite extraordinary. In fact, it's only recently it's a jewel which is in the Wallace Collection, London, and it was presented as far as by Arsene Dola to Claude Martin. We're not sure why it was presented. It might have been Martin's work in the Arsenal. It was something else we don't know, but very, very faintly inspired. In the middle is Claude Martin. And I think it was only a couple of years ago, first of all, the inscription was discovered because what is normally in a glass case is not something you pick up and handle. And it was just before an exhibition on in that was taken out of its case. But he said, oh, from Martin. So it belonged to Martin. Beautiful. 
for the whole book was being written about it. It, it is. Next, please. I talked earlier about the Chateau de Lyon, Jean Martin's house on the back of the Gorti. And this is an interesting picture. It's part of Panorama, which was painted in 1836 by an Indian artist. I think you can certainly recognize the Chateau de Lyon. For a long time, this was called the Fahad Bosch, because after the, it was bought by the Navar, and he, he the Fahad Bosch, or giver of pleasure. We found an inscription fairly recently that those low arches were the excavations were going. And it quite clearly says the Chateau de Lyon, 1782. So I think that this is what Martin wants to call it. This is what we should call it too. Some of this has gone completely. Some of the palette, the right hand side of the chateau, this all demolished. But above it, with red shutters or curtains, you can actually see the residency, the British residency, before it was almost demolished during the uprising of 1850. So if you were looking across the north bank of the river, the Gopti, you would actually see the chateau fully maintained. And in fact, it is starting now excavations going on, something of its former glory, and I Hmm? to get back and see what it looks like. Next, yeah. okay, okay. Next please. Hmm. Uh, this, is this is probably one of Zofany's masterpieces. It's at La Martinia in the now. And it shows its favourite mistress, sometimes called Lisa, adopted when she was a young girl away from the fact that Martin and people like lived very much like lovers with to their various babies. Says Martin had at least seven in, in the young girl Sally that I told you about. It. But Brian is the only one a portrait of. And she's standing here fishing. She has a fishing rod in her hand. And uh, just at the bottom, you can see her reflection inside the tank, and there are actually goldfish swimming around. The boy to her side is also known as James Martin. He was adopted by, not adopted by Martin, though it's possible Martin actually gave him the money, gave me to adopt him. But this is the and he grows up to become an auctioneer. I think in the background, it's probably the much one fort where the Nava was living at the time. Next bit. And I wanted to talk briefly about Martin's other activities. We know that he worked in the arts, intendant of the Nava for a very long time. This is not how he made his money. He made his money by trade, indigo trading, by money lending, by exporting. You say he made it entirely from selling goods to put up the number. But this isn't true. In fact, actually, and us the dollar a huge amount of money because the number was almost short of funds. But one of the advices that Martin set up, and this was very much as a man of the enlightenment, that movement which began in England but strengthened in France in the mid 18th century. But it had here an antidote, but also somewhere where people had markets here. It's 17 miles south of Carnival. 48, 46 miles. There's nothing left to take. Have this treat them. They make sure they have enough food to eat. 
voting with sin. We know that Martin provided uniforms, and he actually required us that, you know, I'm, I'm sure there'll be for the parents in their new uniforms. So he was providing you. And also, we are some as well. We don't even know the extent because we don't have Deboyne's letters or Martin's letters to Deboyne. But Sir Martin was acting as the supplier for Deboyne. Okay, yeah. Who yeah. again? Martin. Martin. You have never been asked this many times before, but what sparked your interest in Lucknow? Fascinating talk. Malik. Very fascinating. Hey, nice. Very 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 nice.
I, because this is the platform where I should be informing that uh, Rosie is coming with her new work, coming up with a new work, which is a stage of Major General Claude Martin at Lucknow. And this is a third book in the trilogy of Claude Martin. And uh, uh, probably, uh, of course, this book is being published from England, but we do hope that some Indian publisher will surely take it up and we will soon be able to have it in India as well. Am I right, uh, Rosie? Yes, absolutely. Can you, can, you, can you just tell us a bit about this book, that what, is, what this book is all about for the audience to... I don't know she has something up her sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, simply, um, on Martin's death, he, with his estate, should go to Stetter near schools, and he says these are schools to, to, without any religious prejudice, you know, you can, the boys should be invited, and there's provision for poor boys. Now, Martin had an absolutely huge estate, and the Chateau de Lille was absolutely crammed with goods, all kinds of things. People called it a perfect museum, it rivaled us and Dola's collection, if you like. So an inventory was done after Martin's death of all of the possessions at the Chateau de Lille and at Constantia and Martignan, which were not finished at the time of Martin's death, and also... Now, the inventory is British Library in London. Yes, it is. And it goes on and on and on for about 80 pages. <laughs> and with Tefford and with the help of Jean-Marie Lafont, a French professor and friend of mine, we managed to get things transcribed. We also transcribed the titles of the books in Ron's library. This took a very long time because the titles had very much abbreviated by the clerks who were noting mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. took about 10 years to establish the identity of many of these okay. books. So this is Location of Sally Begum Stone. What I did was draw six people to so take an aspirin that's in the infantry and write about it. They've got John Ford talking about the carriage and the boats and the balloon, what's in his collection. We've got Charles Gregg talking about silverware, jewellery and paintings. Robert Albert talking about arms and armour. We've got Rosemary Quill talking about textiles, there's a huge textiles found, and we've got James Jasper, who's talking about the scientific equipment, what they call philosophical instruments. So we've got a kind of range of Martin's interests and possessions, and this is why I think it's an important book, because it is the longest, most complete inventory we have for a European in North India in the late Thank you, Rosie. We uh, are uh, looking forward to having this book in India as well. Uh, Dr. Amrita Das, you wanted to come in at this moment? Yes, uh, Rosie, it's been keeping fantastic listening to you. So many new insights. We missed yes. the this year in Lanka, but thanks to virtual mode that has become the new normal, we are sharing the same space. So, you helped me absolutely a thorn, Rosie. The new discoveries have fascinated me on about four year lunch. I hope we'll be able to discover the exact location in the near future. The humane manner in which philanthropic work looked after at his work, is also something new that I didn't know about. And uh, the fact that he almost turned uh, La Martinia into a Freemason lodge, something quite interesting, a different kind of an insight. Also, the acclimatization of the people who came from Europe into the Indian way of life was very interesting along with the photos. I have a few questions, and one of them is that language is a vehicle of culture of interaction. Did any of the Nawabs learn French? Any of the Nawabs or their forefathers or the people of Nutnau, did they learn French with a French kind of read out to teach them the language? And why see what? Did the French learn the Urdu language to communicate? Because you showed us that picture of a lot of people formally socializing. How did they communicate? I would mean, love to hear that. Well, obviously, um, French people um, communicated in French. 
French. Um, but also, they had to speak in Persian too. And we're pretty sure that Martin spoke Persian, he learned Persian. And some of his Persian letters are very much as though he was dictating them because the Persian was not always totally correct. Um, what we do know is that one of the reasons people like um, Jean Thiel and even Martin Hitz were so useful to the novel was that they could actually direct the French in their own language while the novel disappeared after 1775. But we think they were employed to work with the novels. And in that case, they certainly would have been instructed in French. Not never spoke French, as far as we know, and some of them didn't speak English. So it was pretty one-sided. But I should say that among Martin's great library, probably about 40% of the books are in French, and he would have lent them out to people. Very interesting. But it would, it would be fascinating to know if people at that time, people at Nard, picked up the language through just being with each other, listening to conversations. So perhaps something along those lines, if, if you could research a little bit along those lines, would be quite to see how many of them actually learned the language to communicate directly. Thank you, Dr. Amitabha. We, we, we may not. Uh, okay, so we have I'm a sure few. Across it. Uh, so we go on to the uh, few questions that we have received uh, from our viewers today, and I'm happy to inform you that we've had about 150 viewers watching this on the Facebook Live and uh, on the Zoom uh, meeting, which is the largest number that we have ever had on any of our webinars. Now, uh, a question comes uh, for Rosie, uh, which is that, uh, what sparked your interest in Lucknow? Oh, that goes back a very way. Mm -hmm. um, when I was reading Urdu, that's one of our set books was Gushish Lucknow, Old Lucknow, Past Lucknow, which was by Madonna Sharia. And we had to read it in Urdu. And he made Lucknow sound so interesting, I thought, well, it's worth spending a few days there. So during one of my trips while I was at university to India, I thought I'd stay for a week in Lucknow. And interesting, I wish I could remember more about 1972. And one of the things that struck me then was a number of European staff there's no doubt about it. There's been a very, very strong European it, and I couldn't find any guide or I couldn't find any recent guide books. It seemed the only reason people knew about Lucknow was because of the uproar in 1857, but obviously it has been on prehistory. So I decided to write my university thesis on the architecture of Lucknow, and then obviously became interested in involved with the Nabobs and Martin, so it goes back a long way. Uh, another question that we have is that some people believe that Claude Martin was traitor for the French. What is your opinion about it? Uh, well, this is very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard for French people, certainly for some of the French people I know, to accept that Martin deserted. He left Pondicherry. He crossed over to the English. No, I wouldn't call him a traitor. I'd call him a thick man. You can see what happened to those who came behind in Pondicherry. He might well have been killed in bombardment. He might have to walk to Bengal to get a job there. He did the sensible thing, the right thing, by joining the English and quickly became very, very trusted and as was said, Madras tries to bring up French, so so the company. So I don't think I like the word. Another question. I mean, if I mean, if I mean to yeah, me, please, 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 please come. Uh, I think it's hard to be remain in France. So to that extent, it would be a traitor, and it was his intention to go back to, and he was preparing to go back as well when the French Revolution broke. 
no doubt for some such reason. Am I right, Rosie? Um, yes, that's correct. He, he did want to reach them. And I think it was the death, the murder of his friend Antoine Collier who decided him to remain in India. But he did at one point apply for British citizenship. <laughs> I, ha I have to be honest, and, you know, he, he wanted to become British. It might have given him a bit more space. Also, there were prohibitions against um, one British people in the army, but he managed to that at one point you couldn't rise above the rank of them if you were not British. So, how got around that? So another question is that what was the actual purpose for construction of Lamartia, the Constantia? It was to be Martin's tomb. He's buried in the paint, as you know, but I think it got out of hand, and I think Martin himself says it got out of hand. It turned into a huge palace. And in a way, he outgrown the Chateau de Lyon. When you look at all the things he had actually in there, you, you can see that he's outgrown to upsize, if you like. He needs big... Why do you think that he did not do so? And that he did not do so? Yeah. Moved his library and his silver collection. He needed a bigger house and he thought he'd be in the basement. Uh, another question is that uh, we know a lot about the residences of uh, Claude Martin and Lucknow, but we know very little about Jean Gilles and Polier. So, uh, has some research been done, or do people know exactly where they lived when they were in Lucknow? I am not sure about that. I think that was done in Of 
offering the internationally recognized diploma certificates with a lifelong validity. Yes, Alice, I would love that you speak something about Alios's and you know inform our viewers about how important Alios versus Lucknow is to the embassy and for our city, of course, it is very important. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, Alice, it's all yours. Thank you. 